Nobble your nightmares first on BBC One and banish them to room 101. Bergman, B-E-R-G-M-A-N. 60 minutes? Yeah. 60 minutes of television show? Yes. He doesn't want to talk to you. How does he know he doesn't want to talk to me? He don't know what I'm calling him about. He doesn't care to know. You know, it was interesting going to Washington and talking to other journalists who know Lowell Bergman. Right. watching their reactions to him. I mean, I think that told me something about the kind of character I would be playing. Just, just the kind of um, um, professional sort of uh, regard they had for him. Guy who is world-wise, he's street-wise. Uh, his best contacts are probably people who were investigating him 30 years ago, I in the FBI and the DEA. That's how I met him, by the way. We, we had a mutual friend who was in the DEA who said that Lowell Bergman is one of three journalists, investigative reporters, one of the three investigative reporters who I will talk to because when they give me their word, I can go to the bank on it. I say this with tongue-in-cheek, live in a fictional world, you know? And you can make any decision on part, behalf of your characters and rationalize any way you want because it's, it's fiction, you know? When you're dealing with uh, a real person and a series of real events, I think you've got a, a different level of responsibility. You have to understand who and what Jeffrey is to understand the magnitude of this. He is the biggest story of the year, of the decade. He was, at that moment in time, the key witness in the biggest public health issue in America, and the key witness in possibly the most expensive case of corporate malfeasance in U.S. history. Mr. Wagon and a massively important public issue. Four to 500,000 people a year die in the United States from smoking-related illnesses, according to, the, according to the Center for Disease Control. Uh, so this is a massively important story. The biggest, the most important whistleblower in U.S. business to come forward since DeLorean, because you never get corporate officers from Fortune 500 companies coming forward. And 60, it's the news break of the year, if not the decade, and 60 Minutes bails on because of corporate pressure and doesn't air it. So when your back's pushed against the wall like that, or if you're Jeffrey Wigand, and you, you've gone all the way, you, 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 you know you should speak out, you want to speak out, you're impelled to speak out, and yet if you do, your family's going to suffer, you may get arrested when you go back to Kentucky. What did you want to see me about? I don't like being back here. Well, Jeffrey says exactly what's on his mind. Most people consider what they're saying, social skills. Jeffrey just charges right ahead. Now, I know you understood the nature of the confidentiality portion of your severance agreement with Brown and Williamson, Jeff. Chapter and verse. Yeah, I know you do. You know, I came up through sales. One of the reasons I was a great salesman was I never made a promise I couldn't keep. I knew that if I ever broke my promise, I'd suffer the consequences. Is that a threat? We worked together for, what was it, three years? Now, the work we did here is confidential, not for public scrutiny, any more than I one's family matters. You're threatening my family now, too? <laughs> now, don't be paranoid, Jeff. Jeffrey's a man you just don't push. I mean, you might be able to subtly manipulate him. If you're a tobacco company, you know, or if, or you might be able to, uh, the, the tobacco company might have been able to subtly manipulate him. They might have been able to, uh, oh, entice him to a different course of action. But you don't go up into Jeffrey's face and intimidate him. I mean, this is, this is, it, there's just a wrong read on this guy. If there's one guy you don't do that to, it's Jeffrey Wigan. Funnily enough, I was talking to somebody the other day, Jack Palladino, and he was saying the thing that, comes to mind when he thinks of Jeffrey Wigand is the motto of um, 
Um, was it New Hampshire? Don't tread on me. He said it's a very fundamental American thing. You know what I mean? You uh, tread on him for the wrong reasons, and he's not actually going to go away. He's not going to disappear. He's not going to stop stating his opinion. And he's not going to stop telling the truth. It's very difficult to write the screenplay, and that's exactly why Eric Roth and I spent a year on it and why it was so terrific to do it, because it was very difficult, it was very challenging, and very adventurous for two reasons. One is that the, the event is an ocean. It was oceanic in size and scale. It's all kinds of multiple tracks. It went over a long period of time. Every single event had 17, 18 parts. And uh, that's what we started with. Now, I had no interest in doing a docudrama. Uh, or, or a documentary, I wanted to bring, do exactly the opposite. I wanted to bring audience inside the human experience so that you are Jeffrey Wigand. That means something analogous to, say, uh, Z, the Costa Garvis film, or something that feels suspenseful like a thriller, because this was, in life, this was searing. This almost, uh, it was almost life-taking in, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the, almost to the weight of the almost totalitarian hush that uh, intimidation tried to impose on the heart of the man who'd speak out like Jeffrey Wigand. That's not good enough. This guy is the top scientist in the number three tobacco company in America. He's a corporate officer. You never get whistleblowers from Fortune 500 companies. This guy is the ultimate insider. He's got something to say. He wants to say it. I want it on 60 Minutes. It doesn't matter what Look, he am, wants. Am I missing something What here? do you mean, Mike? I mean, he's got a <coughs> corporate secrecy agreement. <laughs> Give me a break. And this is a public health issue, like an unsafe airframe on a passenger jet or some company dumping cyanide into the East River. The issues like that. He can talk, we can air it. They've got no right to hide behind a, a corporate agreement. Pass the note. <laughs> they don't need the right. They got the money. The unlimited checkbook. That's how big tobacco wins every time on everything. They spend you to death. Six hundred million a year in outside legal. Chadburn Park, uh, Ken Starr's firm, Kirkland and Ellis. Listen, GM and Ford, they get nailed after 11 or 12 pickups blow up, right? These clowns have never, I mean ever. Not even one. Not even with hundreds of thousands dying each year from an illness related to their product have ever lost a personal injury loss. I don't think he expected this kind of, uh, you know, he didn't expect to come against this kind of resistance. And I, I, I think it, uh, it challenged him in a way, and it, and it, and it changed him, and, and in a lot of ways, it, it, I hope that it, it shows, it kind of humanizes him in a way. I did not want to fabricate. I did not want to just make up. So when we made three characters into one, when we made a 16-part event into a two-part event, we had to use as our bricks and mortars and the, the tape to tape these things together. We, 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 we kind of used an approach that's similar to collage. Um, I'll give you an example. Mike Wallace never went to Lowell Bergman's hotel room, but he did have that conversation. And Mike Wallace, for 14 years, would call Lowell Bergman at about 5.30 in the morning. So there was a kind of a joking pattern, because Lowell lived in California, Wallace lived in New York. Wallace at 8 o'clock in the morning for him. It's 5 a.m. for Lowell. Did I wake you up? Never wait for an answer. Just keep going. So the fabric of our dramatization where we change things, we wanted to use stuff that would have to mean the same. And that's, that was our technique. And part of the reason I'm here is that I felt that their representation clearly misstated, at least within Brown and Williamson's representation, clearly misstated why the common language within the company. We are in the nicotine delivery business. And that's what cigarettes are for. Delivery device for nicotine. A delivery device for nicotine. Put it in your mouth, light it up, and you're going to get your fix. You're going to get your fix. You're saying that Brown and Williamson manipulates and adjusts the nicotine fix, not by artificially adding nicotine, but by enhancing the effect of nicotine through the use of chemical elements such as ammonia. The process is known as impact boosting. While not spiking in nicotine, they clearly manipulate it. There's extensive use of this technology known as ammonia chemistry. It allows for the nicotine to be more rapidly absorbed in the lung and therefore affect the brain and central nervous system. 
60 Minutes, which is the most prestigious, is the paragon of broadcast investigative journalism in the United States. Been on the air for 30 years in the top 10 shows. Is a terrific moneymaker for CBS Network. Um, and he goes to bring this to the um, to air it, which is the news break of the year, certainly not the decade. And you sent the document forward to Sandifer? I sent the document forward to Sandifer. I was told that we would continue to work on a substitute. We weren't going to remove it as it would impact sales, and that that was his decision. In other words, you were charging Sandifer and Brown and Williamson with ignoring health considerations consciously? Most certainly. And on March 24th, Thomas Sandifer, CEO of Brown and Williamson, had you fired. And the reason he gave you? Poor communication skills. And you wish you hadn't come forward? You wish you hadn't blown the whistle? Yeah, there are times I wish I hadn't done it. There are times I feel com compelled to do it. If you ask me, would I do it again? Do I think it's worth it? Yeah, I think it's worth it. death threats and which the FBI was involved in uh, on his computer, on his telephone, someone left a bullet in his mailbox. I mean, there were, there were significant threats to his life, enough to the point where Lowell has been around the block many times, is streetwise and worldwide, asked a friend of his, Kroll, to lend some uh, bodyguards and had physical security around him. Uh, it's only increased the pressure. Even the attorneys who want to speak out are telling you, we understand, you don't have to. You know, what are you going to do? And you're stuck on a lawn in the Gulf of Mexico, and that was the spot that the actual Jeffrey Wigand really did stand on. It really is Dick Scruggs' house. It really is his lawn. It really is the Gulf of Mexico. He really did walk out on that dock and come right back there on that grass and stand next to Lowell and Dick Scruggs. He said, I can't make up my mind. I want, you know, I don't know what I want to do. So in that crucible, you have to decide. Now, if you decide wrongly, a part of you is going to get annihilated. It's going to go away, and you're never going to be the same person to yourself again. And he knew that. And so he decided to go forward and risk it anyway. So it's human behavior and courage like that uh, with, with, with all of the wonderful contradictions and imperfections uh, people have in real life intact. Another lawyer uh, from, from the uh, San Francisco area uh, gave me a phone call who was working with Lowell and asked me if I'd be interested in representing uh, a major whistleblower uh, and would I do it for free. And I said, well, uh, what's his name? Tell me about him. And uh, he t told me briefly that Jeffrey Wigand was a uh, former Brown and Williamson executive that was teaching high school chemistry, had been fired, and was interested in talking. And, and obviously I was very interested because whistleblowers in the tobacco industry were like finding uh, hen's teeth. Uh, they just, uh, they were either afraid or they were being bought off. I think his, his inner soul uh, came out and said, I got to do something about this. Yeah, this $300,000 salary is nice, but I can't live with myself doing this. So here was a guy who, yeah, he's got warts and bumps just like everybody else in his personal life, but here's a guy who had at least the courage to take on the biggest corporation in the world. What was at stake? A number of things were at stake. I was definitely concerned that, that day of, of the realization that I could go to jail for contempt. That was something that I felt very uncomfortable about. Um, the second thing I was uncomfortable about, that if I didn't go forward at that day, 
I'm not so sure that the process that started would have had the impetus to continue. And weighing both things that day, I weighed and said that if I didn't go forward and didn't give the testimony in Pascagoula, I would not be able to be honest with myself. I was not responding to my moral compass, and I would not have been able to start, as many other people start, what has evolved over the last three to five years. Let's go to court. Dr. Wigan would like to leave now. Some of them were actually smoking cigarettes and blowing smoke rings. Um, they were the most arrogant bunch I've ever seen in my life. And there were probably five or six of us over here preparing to take this deposition. And uh, when we finally got the final word that Jeffrey really would do this thing, uh, and I walked in and gave the signal, these guys went nuts. I mean, the phone started. Uh, they were calling the, the companies. Uh, you know, you could have dropped the stock, I think, if Wall Street would have found out that day. It was that big of an impression. But they really thought they had him bluffed. Okay, Jeff, I'm going to sit you down at that table over there. I want to start as fast as possible. I want to give them a chance to get another restraining order, okay? Let's go. Good luck, Doc. I thought that for Al Pacino to play Lord Bergman was terrific because it's exactly the kind of role that Al has never played before. And that meant that for Al to bring himself to something that was completely new would be very fresh, would be very electric, and, and it would be a different kind of, of artistic work for him. And... Uh, and I don't know, it, it, it is. He's very different in this film. Um, uh, he's very much being the, mo being the moment rather than acting or performing the moment. And, uh, um, and he had not played an intellectual worker, somebody who, who is uh, at home in uh, Baalbek, Lebanon, negotiating an interview with, the, uh, with Sheikh Fadlala, the spiritual head of the Hezbollah, as he is on the streets of, mean streets of New Orleans, you know, working on a, say, a segment about corruption in the Orleans Police Department. You manipulated me into this. That's bull, Jeff. You greased the rails. I greased the rails for a guy who wanted to say yes. I helped him to say yes. That's all. You're not a robot, Jeff. Right? You got a mind of your own, don't you? Up to you, Jeffrey. That's the power you have, Jeffrey. Vital insider information the American public need to know. Lowell Bergman, the hotshot who never met a source he couldn't turn around. I fought for you, and I still fight. You fought for me? You manipulated me. Into where I am now. Staring at the Brown and Williamson building. It's all dark. He said the 10th floor. That's the legal department. I was looking for what was in Jeffrey Wigand's, an actor who could B, what's in Jeffrey Wigand's heart. Jeffrey Wigand is a very A- tonal, very arrhythmic kind of a guy. He's kind of awkward. He feels awkward within his own body. And, um, and what was going to happen to him was very much like a, like a, like a, like internal damage, damage the internal organs from, from concussion. You know, that's what was going to occur because of the crushing weight of the quite legal litigation, but the weight of the litigation by tobacco companies who basically tried to, to defeat him and destroy him. So it's somebody who could have that sense of dying from the inside out, and, and Russell hit that note. When Russell hit that note, then he was the guy. The fact that he's Australian and 20 years too young is irrelevant. You could fix that stuff with, with, with uh, craft. Did you lie about being on the American judo team in the Olympics? What? Some public relations guy got hold of a tape of an interview where you're saying you were on the American judo team in the Olympics. What kind of kid is this? I, I was... I was not on the team. I sparred with the Olympic team. Okay. All right. ABC Telemarketing uh, Company? ABC? ABC Telemarketing Company. A can opener. A $39.95 can opener. I canceled payment. It was junk. You ever bounce a check, Lowell? You ever look at another woman's tits? You ever cheat a little on your taxes? Whose life, if you look at it under a microscope, doesn't have any flaws? Oh, that's the whole point, Jeffrey. That's the whole point. Anyone's, everyone's. They are going to look under every rock. 
dig up every flaw, every mistake you've ever made. They are going to distort and exaggerate everything you've ever done, man. Don't you understand? What does this have to do with my testimony? That's not What does truth. it have to do with you my testimony? Truth. I no, told the know. truth. It's, it's not about telling the truth. and proof. That's not the point whether you told the truth or not. Hello? I told the truth. Plummer, you know, it's interesting about who should play play Wallace. It's one of those things where when you if you do what I do and you're casting it, you don't look for physical similarities. That's the last thing you worry about. You 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 can't take somebody who looks physically who's actively physically dissimilar, like this person never like Danny DeVito cannot play Mike Wallace, okay? Uh who's a Danny's a friend of mine, I hope he doesn't take offense at that, but he's not Mike Wallace. Uh but aside from that, it's then who has the you capture the spirit of of a of a person, um, and that's what Chris got, and then the outward manifestations of it, you just kind of you know those are just kind of tailored. Mike, 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 Mike. Try Mr. Wallace. We work in the same corporation. Doesn't mean we work in the same profession. What, what are you going to do now? You're going to finesse me, lawyer me some more? I've been in this profession 50 f years. You and the people you work for are destroying the most respected, the highest rated, the most profitable show on this network. Every single person I talked to in my research, including Jeffrey, it was, it was about being unfairly treated as an individual, you know? And in a kind of a, what has become a typical way in America, the greatest American heroes are byproducts of what their intention was in the first place. And uh, Jeffrey was just kind of like, you know, as an individual, seeking some kind of justice and uh byproduct of that is a great positive step forward for american society you know the worst kind of an organized smear campaign against the whistleblower shoplifting failing to pay child support dr wagon's deposition will be part of this record you wish you had known the person <laughs> Do I think it's worth it? I told the truth. It's valid and true and to these people. people. That's not the point whether you tell the truth or not. Are you a businessman or are you a newsman? Does he go on television and tell the truth? Yes. Is it newsworthy? Yes. Are we going to air it? Of course not. Why? Because he's not telling the truth. No, because he is telling the truth. And the more truth he tells, the worse it gets.